This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, yes, um, so starting with a quotation about Peter the Great, about the great Europeanizer of Russia, but actually saying that um, Peter was not the first to be dealing with Europe and engaging with Europe, and in fact, to a a fairly large extent, Peter was continuing traditions of earlier Muscovite rulers, in particular his father Alexei Mikhailovich, who died in 1676. And so, partly my idea here is that there are previous windows onto Europe um, uh, that created through particularly these translations. The focus of my research is medical knowledge, and I particularly look at the Russian court's medical department, which is known as in English as the Apothecary Chancery, in which all of the medical practitioners are foreign um, practitioners. They are all particularly from Northern European, Protestant, Northern Europe in particular. And so these particular men, as well, alongside their sort of uh, duties of caring for people, were also expected to provide various texts and actually to compose various texts in Latin on the basis of other Western European medical texts which were then translated into Russian for various uses of the Russian court. Um, so these particular texts form a very important point in Russia and Europe knowledge exchange, but we actually have very little work on the texts themselves. And it's interesting to note in looking at these various texts, and particularly the Russian versions, that the Russian translators are truncating, editing, rephrasing, and even in some cases adding to the Latin texts to which they have um, access. And so in the Apothecary Chancery, and this isn't a, a general comment about translation in Muscovy, but really specifically about the Apothecary Chancery, in that department their translation is very much about selecting things rather than an attempt to get an entire text. Um, so, this is what I will be describing here today and bringing forward several different examples of different types of text that they have and how they are actually rendering them into Russian. So I think we need to go forward. Yeah, so this is just a very brief um, diagram of, of what you would have in the Apostle Chancery. So we have all the various medical practitioners and we also have secretaries. So under this rubric you would have uh, translators and scribes. Um, okay, if we go on to the next slide. And so this is the apostrophe transfer is one of a number of court departments, and here's just a brief kind of overview of the kind of departments you would have. And if we could go on again, and so then actually the directors, and this is important to the reports, the directors are, are gathering together reports and translations of various things in part in order to advise the Tsar and his counsellors. So there's actually a very direct link here between knowledge and up into the Muscovite power hierarchy. Again, if you could, um, yeah, and I'll just pause there in the, the PowerPoint for the moment. So, um, one of the issues we have is who is doing the translating, and as we've already heard this morning, in, in, often in Western Europe we have a very good idea of who is doing the translating, and we often know an awful lot about them. In Russia, the opposite really is true. We often don't have any kind of name for these people. Even if we do have a name, sometimes it is simply a name. And the Russians very commonly Russianize people's surnames. So, for example, there is a physician in the Apothecary Chancery who was, whose name was Von Garden. He is often called Thunkadarov because they simply Russianize everyone's name. So even if we do know someone's name, we don't necessarily get a lot of information from that name other than this was the name that the particular scribe decided to call them or call themselves. Um, so we don't know a lot about the translators, particularly as individuals. What we do know about them is the kind of effect translators and actually scribes more broadly in Russia have on the texts they write. And scribes have a huge amount of power over written texts. So to briefly talk about the work of uh, Daniel E. Collins, who's a historical linguist who works on Muscovite trial documents, he has actually shown that the influence of scribes over documents is so, so huge, they could shift the emphasis of evidence, and scribes were bribed 
when, when they were taking down evidence because this could actually sway a trial. So great was their ability to edit and rephrase things that what got written down, that was the evidence. And so even though we know so little about these men as individuals, clearly they are having a very, very substantial effect. And what Collins has seen in his trial documents really does seem to be true in the actual, in, in the chancery system widely and in the apothecary chancery. They are paraphrasing, they are editing, they are moving things around. Uh, so this is a very important point to bear in mind, even though we don't know who these, these men are, they are very heavily affecting what is going on. Okay, so oral reports, and here we come to one of the difficulties of Russian documents, is that we don't always have the original to work from. And one of the reasons is that for very brief reports, we actually, um, the, the physicians would have spoken their text, and we actually have this in the documents, uh, Dr. Graham Skazal and uh, Dr. Graham said, and they would speak in Latin and be transcribed directly into Russian. So we don't have an original Latin text to work from. Nevertheless, we can say something about what is going on in this translation process. So if we go on to the next slide. So this is from a, an autopsy of 1658, when a priest's wife was found dead, and it was considered to be um, an issue because uh, she had various marks on her body after death, and it was considered that perhaps this was plague, and this was obviously a big problem. Uh, so we have a couple of physicians' opinions um, written on this. So uh, the first opinion, uh, Engelhardt, Dr. Engelhardt writes, or was transcribed as saying that, that woman had scrofula of the stomach, whatever exactly that might mean, and that scrofula does not cause the plague. And if we could go on to the next one. This is the transcription of his colleague's statement that, that follows after. This is Dr. Graham um, saying that the woman had scrofula. Did it change? It did change. <laughs> so I will explain, yes. I will explain why it looks like that. That woman had scrofula of the stomach, and that scrofula does not cause the plague. And as, as you can in fact see, they say identical things, or they recorded as saying identical things. And interestingly, there is a difference in the Russian text, but the difference is a different spelling of the word scrofula. <coughs> so, how likely is it that these two men said exactly verbatim the same thing about this particular case? It seems like that would be a slightly odd thing to do. And it seems here fairly likely that the scribe has been shortening their, their report and has put it into what they feel to be the most appropriate phrasing and has simply um, has taken what they were told and has then put it into the appropriate form for the document. And that's actually, it's great that you kind of, you just have to try and change. And good, because yeah, good response. It, 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 does, it does, it shows that um, even though they are supposed to be recording responses from different people, they're actually smoothing out differences and just giving us certain aspects of whatever the Latin original was. Um, so this here we would apparently see them um, kind of essentially paraphrasing what the physicians give us. Um, we also see, I will sort of skip ahead slightly because of time, but we also see um, these physicians often give reports in concert, in which case we don't have uh, um, necessarily a listing of what each physician says, but simply if we move to the next one. Um, this is a fitness report, so uh, a musketeer who'd been injured, can he still serve? And this is all we get given about the report. We don't get given an, an analysis of um, which particular doctor thinks what. We just get given this is our final collective report. And so it, these, these oral reports tend to simplify and um, put the words together in a way that it expresses information, but it doesn't tell us a lot about how the physicians actually phrase themselves. So it does seem that these particular oral reports are actually being um, shaped, at least to some extent, by the scribes and by the translators. Um, so if we then move on, here we go. And this is just a, a brief photo of one of the actual um, written reports, two are actual um, written reports, and what happens in written reports. Translation is a big problem for the Muscovites. It is very difficult to get hold of people who speak Russian, write, and write Russian properly, and also who know Latin properly. 
1685 there's the establishment of the Slavo Greco Latin Academy, which improves things notably. Um, but the other strategy and a strategy they continue to use even after 1685 is to find a Polish person on the basis that they're Catholic and so they must know Latin, but also Slavic, <laughs> so they must understand Russian. This creates some problems. Um, so, if we move on to the next slide, here would be, um, unfortunately, this is probably not very or possibly not at all comprehensible to uh, many people in the room, but this is a fairly good translation of Latin into Russian. This is interestingly a 1690 report on the University of Padua. Is Padua a good medical institution? And this, it is, I mean, not really word for word, that would be very difficult between Latin and this Russian of this period, but it, it translates everything, and it translates everything about a text. We don't have universities in Russia, and yet they are able to describe um, what's going on in the Latin text fairly well. Um, and then if we move on, so this is an earlier translation, and this is again an autopsy, and um, um, again, I think, unfortunately, you probably have to take my word for this, but the Russian, again, follows the Latin fairly well. This is not always the case. And again, if we, if we can move on, thank you. So, this is from a series of reports on unicorn horn and their appropriateness for use in medicine. And this, I think, if we look at the English, it is clear that this is a slightly bizarre text. And so, in a box is placed a curse, and the unicorn horn will be with it, and immediately the curse will be broken into pieces, and many other ways are made about which those who have seen know. Um, we do not have the Latin original. <laughs> we do not have the Latin original for this text, but um, I am trying to keep, keep as close to the original Russian as possible, and it is very, very strange. Huh. I don't think the translators knew what they were reading, really. Um, it's interesting to compare this to a known experiment about unicorn horns by the Italian physician David de Pomis, who said that one should place a part of a unicorn horn in a box with scorpions and that then the scorpions would die. So if we go back to our bizarre text, we have a curse. This could very loosely be translated as an accursed thing. So if we remember that these are Northern Europeans, possibly Polish people translating this text, would they know what a scorpion is? So possibly, considering the existence of this other Western experiment to do with unicorns, which involves scorpions, this could be the De Pommes experiment or something like it, rendered fairly inexpertly into Russian. And so we actually see some significant problems in the translations and some significant changes to the text. Um, here obviously I'm, I'm proposing that we do have changes without the Latin text, which is slightly difficult, but it does appear that the quality of the translator in this case made a very significant effect on the final Russian report. Um, we also have other examples. Um, I think if we just stay on... Oh, okay, that's fine. Um, so we have other examples. Um, we have an example of a 1665 text on Valeria Greek by the English physician Samuel Collins. His, we have his Latin text, and then in the Russian we have his report, and then there is an additional section that we do not have an author for, uh, that is apparently um, taken from the herbal with 520 chapters, which is identified as a Russian herbal. Collins did not speak enough Russian to be um, supplementing his own work with quotes from other documents. It would seem, in that particular case of the Valerian report, that whoever translated Collins' text then went and added in material from a secondary source to supplement Collins report. So we actually have someone adding in something else. We don't know who added in something else. The translators were not trained in medicine. We have no evidence that they were ever sent off to any kind of medical school. So this is very likely a lay person adding in extra medical information into a text written by an English physician. Um, so what we then have up here is another report by Collins from the previous year, 1664. He wrote a report on astrology, and we have the Latin and we have the Russian, and Maria Nkovskaya has looked at this document and found that various things were edited from it, but didn't specify particularly what. I have um, followed her work and looked at those documents again, and I agree that it has been edited, and this is what has been removed. These are from various points in the text, so it isn't just something that's been missed, something has been taken out. 
Um, and these are what have been taken out. So the first three are all biblical quotes, and then the final one is um, referencing the kind of biblical era events. And these are all about the idea of um, signs and the stars and how God communicates and influences um, the world through signs and stars. And so apparently um, promoting the use of astrology is appropriate through biblical quotations. This is removed in the Russian version. This does not exist in the Russian. And it seems that someone has gone through Collins' text and simply cut out what they didn't like. And so we have various versions here. We have some, we have some good translations that follow the text fairly well. We have some bad translations. We have te translations with additional information. And we have translations with things that have been removed. Um, and so if we move on. Very I think you, you need to that sort of between five and ten parts. Okay. So you, you, okay. You, okay. So we, we don't want to rush too much. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, and so if we then move on to our next. Um, so these are what I'm broadly terming medical books on a particularly kind of pharmacy text, so collections of medical recipes that particularly use fairly complex chemical um, procedures. We have a number of these texts in Russian that are in some way associated with the Apothecary Chancery. Um, and these are interesting documents um, in their relationship to Western knowledge. So if we could go on to the next slide. So this is one of the earliest ones we have associated with the department, um, and it identifies itself in the following way, on a computer, on the preparations of medicines translated from Latin into Slavonic, AD 1676. Uh, this is all of the information it gives us about what it is and where it comes from. So it very clearly identifies itself as coming from Latin, but it does not tell us which text it comes from, or who might have um, written the original text, or who might have translated this text. Uh, you could go on to the next one. Um, similarly, a rather longer introduction to a, a different pharmacy, the Pharmacy for Transport or Service, um, compiled in a concise fashion from various apothecary or surgical books, the good of service persons and their horses, uh, produced with the zeal and toil of His Highness the Tsar's apothecary Daniel Gertin in the Imperial City of Moscow, 1708. So here, I think, interesting is this idea um, compiled in a concise fashion from various apothecary or surgical books. Then this is an idea which comes up in several Russian pharmacy texts of this period. They tell us that they have been brought together from various sources. They don't tell us what these sources are. And if we then move on to the next text, which is similarly a text associated with this Daniel Gertie, who is, as the text says, one of the Tsar's uh, top apothecary men. The large home pharmacy with which any person, if there is no surgeon available, can give help not only to oneself, but also to any cattle and any infirmities collected from many medical works in the Imperial City of Moscow, 1705. So these particular pharmacy texts we have identified themselves as collections from other already existing works and elsewhere they also do say that they are coming from the Latin or give various signs that they are coming from the Latin and such a heavy use of Latin terminology. Um, and so it appears that the Apothecary Chantry in, com in compiling these medical recipe books, they appear to be taking apart various Latin texts and putting them back together in Russian and in these different forms. Um, it's also interesting the length of the, what I should refer to as the Apothecary Chantry pharmacy texts. They are very, very, very short for pharmacy texts of this period. All of the three that I've brought up here are under 100 pages, which is very short um, for this kind of thing. And in fact, the Pharmacy for Transport or Service is only 16 chapters long. We have lost the end of it. But even so, um, it does seem to be very noticeably short. So once again, we do have the appearance that um, as these texts are being brought into Russian, they are being <coughs> pulled about, they are being changed, they are being, uh, the Russian texts are essentially almost new texts created only on the basis of some Latin text or some Latin 
texts. We also then have, um, which I don't have a slide for, but the another very interesting book, which is um, essentially translated as a, um, a collection from Doctor's Knowledge, which uh, is interestingly compiled by one of the archbishops of the Russian Church, Archbishop Afanasi of Holmogory, and again our friend Dan Gurchin, which is actually the pharmacopoeia, but rewritten. So once again, having it sort of created a Russian text from a Latin text, <coughs> they then revise it and rewrite it into a whole new Russian text. The reason we consider them to be separate texts is that this, the um, Athanasi Pomegranate book, is certainly heavily based on the pharmacopoeia, but it is not entirely based. There is certainly some other source, possibly some other sources, that it is based upon. So, um, these pharmacy texts, unfortunately, I haven't um, been able to do as much research on that, those, that specific group of texts as they really deserve, but an initial look at them, it does appear that they are unusually short, and they do appear to have been compiled from various Western European sources in creating almost a new set of Russian language texts. Um, if we then move on to, I think, our final slide. So, again, I should say this is not a, a general comment about translation in Muscovy, but a, a comment about translation in the Apostle Chantry. There is a very big interest in this department in using and in translating the Western European medical knowledge, and yet when they do this, they are very, very selective in what they do. And if you think back to those reports, even the process of creating a report rather than translating a whole text about a particular subject suggests the idea of selection. This is what they are interested in, is they want the knowledge, but they want the parts of it that they have picked. So here, the Apostle Chantry's translation of knowledge is about selection, not an attempt to faithfully represent a whole text. And I shall finish there. Fantastic, Tony. Um, what I think the idea was that if anybody had any specific point of clarification um, now to ask Claire, um, to ask it now, but otherwise we would save uh, more general discussion for the end, for the 15 minutes at the end. So has anybody who's got anything that... Um, I, I, I just wanted to, to check um, everything that they're translating. So the, these foreign uh, people in the chancery, mm -hmm. are they're all writing in Latin. Yes, they're okay. all writing in Latin. And, and the scribes are always translating from Latin. Yeah. Um, and therefore, and do is there evidence of the scribes or the translators? So you, you kind of link the scribes and the translators together. Mm -hmm. um, did they have, would they have had to have had pharmacological knowledge in order to do the translations that you're talking about? I don't think they had any special training. There was no evidence of them getting, there was no evidence of them getting proper translation training and proper language training. Right. They certainly didn't get, or there's no evidence of them ever having any kind of pharmacy medical training at all. Okay, so all they needed to do was to know Latin. Basically, yes. And be told that they to select. Yeah, yeah. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be the person doing the translating that was doing the selecting. There's actually kind of a hierarchy of of basically people who write. And so what we would see in different, um, so not the translation, but what we see in other documents is that documents get drafted and then by a junior clerk or a junior secretary, they would then be edited by a senior secretary and then the junior clerk would be sent to go and rewrite the text in the proper form. Okay, so the, the two processes of selecting and translating maybe, maybe they in could stages. Be. It could well be. We don't have the exact documents to kind of follow that process along, but it could well be that it's actually more than one person doing that. Um, and yes, I would say in, in kind of stages that they, they decide what's going to be cut out. But certainly the final versions, the, the neat final versions, <coughs> they do have these, this significant editing. Okay, so we've got two separate people. Thank you, Thank you very much. <coughs> okay, and I think we'll press on. Thank mm -hmm. you very much.